Great. So today's webcast is defining quality beer through education, um, something that Jeremy and I have spoken a lot about over the years. Uh, but it's a great conversation to continue and um, to to see how resources and consumers change to influence what we should be educating and the types of education we should provide um, for not only our customers, but our staff to help support um, our consumers. But some housekeeping uh, things, if you have any questions, uh, chime in anytime during this talk. Um, you can use the Q&A box would be preferable, uh, but I will be monitoring the chat box as well. Uh, this will be recorded and posted to the White Labs uh, YouTube channel, uh, probably within 24 hours. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, more importantly, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm pretty excited to have set this up, you know, quite a while together and, and yeah. finally make it happen. But my name is Eric Fowler, Education Manager here at White Labs, for anybody that doesn't know me. Um, Jeremy, did you want to in introduce yourself a little bit and talk about your background, uh, Good Beer Matters, maybe how you and I even started talking a couple years ago? Sure. Um, hopefully some of you may know me, but I'm, I'm Jeremy Storden. I started um, Good Beer Matters podcast a few years ago because um, as I, I, I kind of came into the beer industry kicking and screaming a little bit, um, uh, living in Orange County or living in San Diego in Orange County, I wasn't really into beer, moved to just outside of Bend, Oregon, and when in Rome, you do as the Romans do, and so I got into beer, um, and uh, I, and I fell into beer. I didn't think that was a worthwhile career. I, you know, I thought of other things, and but I fell into it and loved it, and here I am. Uh, so I've got my um, became a certified Cicerone because that seemed to make sense, and became a beer judge because that seemed to make sense to get me to the Cicerone and 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 on and on and had some wonderful opportunities come my way to write and, and everything but when it came to time to learn more about uh, the beer industry that I was quickly falling in love with I started looking for podcasts and um, some of the only podcasts I can find at the time were three or four hours long and it was just a, a bunch of dudes sitting around uh, getting drunk and trying to crack each other up with uh, inside jokes that I didn't get and so um uh, I also discovered that trying to get uh, beer industry leaders to sit down and talk with me for about an hour wasn't going to happen. So I started a podcast and got them to sit down and talk with me for an hour and then share it with everyone else, all the, all the lessons I learned. Um, and so uh, it, it's just been a fantastic ride. Next thing you know, um, uh, things just kind of start happening. And, and here we are today talking with Eric Fowler from White Labs and, and everyone listening in. This is awesome. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, been great to work with you over the years. I can't remember when we did our podcast together. Was it I, two I, years ago now? I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, I, so one, so the whole purpose of the Good Beer Matters podcast, quick plug, is really to dive into both the craft and the culture of beer. So I really want to get into uh, the science and artistry of brewing better beer, whether it's ingredients or process or, or tasting or whatnot. Uh, but also the uh, culture at large, just to get a, a deeper context of, of why beer matters, why good beer matters. Um, and so that's why, Eric, you and I talked, because I wanted to get the lowdown on yeast and understanding yeast, which is a pretty complicated topic, even for brewers sometimes. Um, and, and so that's why I had you on the show. And I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, and that that was a fantastic episode. I've, I've been homebrewing since 2007. And and I knew how to put yeast into it, and I've learned how to kind of how to deal with it. But there was still just a shroud of mystery over yeast in the process. So, yeah, and there, you know, and there, there still is for most consumers, most people working for breweries, and even some brewers or, or you know, quality control staff too. There's a, a lot of variables, and I don't want to say a lot of unknowns, but there tends to be a lot of unknowns because people aren't looking at those variables or documenting them correctly. Yeah. You know, and I think, um, you know, your, your mission with what, what you've been doing and <clears throat> within the industry and then um, from your podcast as well resonates a little bit with what this series of webcasts has turned into. And, you know, we were, we were talking before logging in today and, you know, the first couple we did of these were very technical driven and we still have some of those peppered in, but 
what we started realizing is, you know, there's a lot of people within beer aside from production staff that are talking about yeast and fermentation, right? There's somebody serving a Hefeweizen over a bar or wondering why uh, the bottle conditioned beer tastes different stored at warm, you know, on sh warm shelf compared to a cooler and yeah. um, bringing different industry experts into, you know, talk about fermentation from the perspective um, through their lens has been pretty eye opening because I think it's uh, really made it a little bit more accessible. Uh, you know, when you're on the, the yeast and fermentation side day in and day out as we are, you get really bogged down with um, some of the specifics of the technicality of the products and the, you know, different aspects of fermentation that we're working with that it, it might not be as accessible and put into layman's terms. So yeah, you know. yeah. I think um, we could have a conversation about yeast and yeast could be that center of that conversation, but you could have a ray that goes out and talks to the professional brewers and maybe that ends up on the uh, Master Brewers podcast, or you could have a ray that goes out to home brewers. Uh, we're still talking about yeast, but a very different conversation. And then we could have yet another one that goes out to servers in a tap room talking about that Hefeweizen or that Kvike, uh beer that kind of like you just mentioned. And that's still yet a completely different conversation, but yeast is still at the center of that. And I think it's important to um, have a targeted conversation about this stuff so that people walk away with something valuable. Completely. So I think, you know, the, the topic of today's conversation uh, and the relevancy to yeast and fermentation is um, driven by the consumer as, you know, anybody that's listened to me talk knows I, I stress a lot and that's just something that's not spoken about enough. Um, you know, it's, everybody's curious to how geeky the beer can get, but does the customer understand what makes that special? And a lot of times that's, you know, fermentation as an aspect of what makes that, that beer product so, so special. So today, you know, we'll talk about what staff education actually looks like and the tool, um, tools to educate and engage. I think, um, engagement something that we should probably spend a little bit more time diving into than um, just education because you can throw information at somebody and if they don't care they don't care yeah um, you know i think looking at it backwards by educating your staff and engaging your staff is a great key to in return um, creating a good culture and and then a good product because of that and, and you know giving your customers a good product and a good um a good experience based off of an engaged staff is really key and all kind of ties back in through it, doing that through education. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For, for me, the answer I try uh, to arrive at no matter what I do, whether it's podcast episode or an article or anything like that, I always try to uh, answer the question. So what? And, and hopefully we can answer that question. So what, when we're talking about yeast and, and, um, and when you and I talk, I've kind of got a nice, 30,000 foot macro view of it. But then at some point I need to put my feet on the ground and, and walk away with something that I can act, actually use. So that, that's, that's, that's always been kind of my guiding approach. And it sounds like we're going to do the same thing. Yep. Um, and then, you know, it, it, how does, how does staff education impact the customer again? Um, having a happy staff and engaged staff and educated staff um, is really important, but why are we doing all that? Why are we striving to do that? Why are we investing time and resources I, to do that? I, I think the the boots on the ground answer uh, for me and what I've experienced through um, time working in uh, restaurants and now working in the beer industry, serving restaurants is it, it, every single one of us, whether we're beer savvy or not, we can walk into a place and you just kind of feel the pulse of what's going on there. I mean, just it, it's kind of like your immediate reaction of, do you like the place? Yes or no. Kind of like you taste a beer. You don't have to know why, but do you like it? Yes or no. That's the only question you have to answer if you drink beer. Um, because if you don't like it, if you don't like the place, well, then you can just leave. Your customers are not required to go through the process of understanding why they don't like a place and to tell you about it. That's a gift if they do. Um, but I think uh, creating that place that people want to arrive at and, and want to stay at and they want to have a beer or two and then come back again next week or next Friday and bring more friends. That's 
for me, that's kind of what we all strive for. And so the question is, how do we achieve that? Um, and that's a longer answer, but as far as education goes, when you have a staff that, um, that has kind of a high level of energy, a high level of knowledge, a high level of confidence, a high level of, uh, of brand loyalty, they pass that good feeling onto the guests. So the guests want to come back for more. The beer's got to be good. The food's got to be good. The environment's got to be good. The music can't suck. Um, uh, and that, that's a completely different debate, right? What that means. But I think having, you know, our, your staff, and I'm talking to business owners, your staff are your primary uh, representatives of, of the business. And if they don't have the tools to carry that, that, um, that vibe or that energy or, or that, uh, that brand, that branding uh, awareness to it, to your customers, then, then something's amiss, I think. Yep, definitely. And I think that applies um, equally to, you know, back of house staff as it yeah. does front of house staff, because, you know, in this industry, it's fairly synonymous, right? We all engage with each other quite a bit. So it's really important to make that connection and um, expectation too, right? That you yeah. uh, are representing something bigger than you. And um, how do we get our customers as excited as our staff, you know, and that starts with the staff and equipping them with, with the tools and knowledge to feel confident um, that they're speaking and representing something bigger, but, but remaining accurate. And on the, the fermentation side and what we've experienced is um, it, it can be kind of a dense subject. So yeah, the barrier to entry is a little bit higher sometimes, um, but there are easy ways of doing that specifically through food or, you know, fortunately we're working with beer here yeah um and it, people are generally already pretty interested well it, and and you made a good point of of just uh being people being engaged um passion is a fantastic thing and i think the beer industry has been running on uh passion fuel for quite a few years now um but at some point i think we need something a little bit bigger i think uh purpose is a use is a word that i that i use it's like passion just being giddy and excited like you and I get about beer and food and everything else. Um, but having a purpose about whether it's a mission driven brewery or tap room, or if it's, you know, my purpose is to create a better relationship and a better experience for these guests to, you know, create social justice or something along those lines. I think having that mindset helps, but it's, I think it starts with the tools to allow your staff to, really drive that. And I agree back in the house, front of the house, one team. Yeah. It's, it's often overlooked, right? Because schedules are different setting up training and education programs, which we'll get to in a couple slides more specifically uh, the logistics of it when it comes to different departments and different positions is, is a fairly big hurdle Yeah, uh, timing. And, you know, it's, it's, a lot of sales in front of house staff might be a little more flexible or start their day later. Yeah. Whereas production staffs generally early and can't break away quite as easy. Um, so those are all considerations, you know, when creating an, an education program and defining what you're educating on. Uh, you know, I think the biggest one, the most obvious is, you know, we're, we're generally all working for breweries. Um, or, or beer consumers, just understanding your products, understanding your brands. Uh, what's been your experience, uh, you know, working for breweries and dealing with different portfo portfo portfolios yeah. on um, communicating what makes those brands special? Um, I think the, um, the best thing that we can have is, is with, a, let's say, a bartender or a server in this, in this, context of this question when um when they go from just ordinary order taker because anyone can be an order taker and and we've all worked with order takers we may hopefully um not have been order takers but you know they they show up and they're just like you know can i get you some water what, what can i get you to eat um I, I think it's even more impactful to have table guides um and these are people who know the menu. These are people who know the beer. They know the flavor profiles and they know how to put them together. And maybe they walk up to the table 
and engage with the folks uh, or the, your guests in a in a more colloquial way. Um, uh, but but they can figure out what kind of experience are people here for. Uh, I had a restaurant manager tell me years and years and years ago that people go out to restaurants for two different reasons. One, either to have an experience they cannot have at home or to avoid doing the dishes. And, and so if you have people that are just at your place because they want to avoid doing the dishes, well, how can you turn them into raving fans? And if people want to have an experience they can't have at home, how can you give them the experience they want? Um, but, but going from that order taker, they're just showing up and doing their job, becoming that table guide. Now you're taking the, the onus and the, um, and the burden on your shoulders to know what you're talking about and be able to describe it in a way that um, kind of elevates the experience. Um, the food pairing is a perfect example of this. I think that it would be the, the, the standard. It's, it's not the standard now, but um, I think Eric, you and I might agree that that is a standard that is very, very achievable uh, and with, without a lot of difficulty to get people to that point where they know what the beer tastes like, they know what the food tastes like, and they know what works well together. Um, but having that, uh, if, if you don't have staff that is at that level yet, then giving them that script so that they know at least the script. Maybe you have employees who aren't 21 yet and they can't taste the beer or drink the beer afterwards. Give them a script so at least they know what to say. But, but you know, you can kind of tell when someone's regurgitating a script versus riffing on something that they know a lot about. Um, I think one of the most challenging times I have at a, at a place when, like we talked about, you could tell that no one really cares or just showing up and it's just, it's just a job. Um, but, when you ask someone about the beer at a brewery and, and someone says, Oh, I don't know. Oh, let me go ask. Okay. Yes. Please go ask. Um, I, I think most people who are on this, um, on this uh, webinar are, are probably, um, no more than the average beer customer. But if you think your average beer drinker, average beer customer, it's kind of nice for your staff to know more than the average. And that's kind of where Cicerone kind of came, came in, I think for us. Um, just to have that level of knowledge and confidence. And you'll see a change in the affect of your staff too, when they at least know more than their average customer. Yeah. So what are, you know, some tools that you've seen to um, kind of aid in that? What are some specific trainings that you've been part of or that you've seen success successful, right? The, the most obvious is just pre-shift training. Yeah. Um, but yeah. again, that makes it a little difficult to, get the back of house, the production staff involved. Um, what, are, what are some some tools that you've seen that's successful in, in connecting the whole brewery to be on the same page for some of that? I've, what, I've, what I've seen uh, is discrepancies sometimes in the way that um, a, a production staff or a brewer might describe a brand compared to uh, the person that's actually serving and sale, selling it. And that's mm -hmm. always concern. That's always a concern to me when they're working with the same product. Yeah. Uh, in a tap room situation, um, knowing full well that people don't have budgets for full on trainings and, and all that sort of stuff, they, the simplest, easiest way that uh, not everyone does, but everyone should is, you know, have a pre-shift lineup where um, let's talk about the, the theme of today or the theme of this week is here. We have this uh, Saison on draft, uh, so I want everyone to come taste it. I want you to smell it. I, let's talk about it. It could take uh, no more than 15 minutes. It can even take less if, if you're quick about it, but have everyone taste it and and have everyone spit out, okay, what, what would you pair with this? Oh, I, I'd pair it with the hot dog. I'd pair it with the cheese board. I'd, I'd pair it with the, with the, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I think just that tiny little step is a tremendous first step for that anyone can implement today. Um, going a little bit uh, deeper into that, um, uh, specifically breweries, uh, if you already have a tasting panel, grab people from the kitchen, grab people from, uh, the front of the house and have them be a part of the panel because you're going to get, uh, unbiased palates when it comes to tasting and evaluating, uh, the beer QA, uh, but it's also going to act as a really good, um, 
a way to communicate between front of house, back of house and brewery. Uh, uh, but it's also going to give your staff a little bit more training and, and a little bit more confidence that, hey, I, I know what this beer tastes like because every Monday we go taste this beer to make sure it's on point. And, and, um, and a couple of days ago we tasted it and it was off and we caught it. And, and I think that is uh, an extremely valuable step that anyone can start today. Yeah, I think it's a great point looking at training staff to a higher standard to be more knowledgeable than than your your customers, right? Mm -hmm. And the way in my experience that that lexicon and that communication varies um, can be pretty drastic. Um, and it kind of comes back to the example of, you know, how you know, us in the office might be talking about yeast and fermentation and might change the way we're explaining that dependent on yeah. the audience and, and who we're speaking to. Uh, so I completely agree with uh, sensory as being a great tool. And so, you know, you can see here two birds, one stone, right? Because you're getting yeah. usable uh, data and feedback as well as inadvertently training. You're, you're structuring something to your to be a formality and it i've in my experience when something is formalized when something's consistent the seriousness of it um, is a little bit more obvious to the attendees stuff like um, pre-shift um, tastings i think are always great but it can be really casual it might not be retained the same way whereas um, you know our sensory panels every wednesday at 10 30 so it's happening right in five minutes without me. Um, and, you know, so what, what we've seen and how to use that as a training tool has um, come in, in multiple ways. So first, you know, developing a brand profile for internal purposes. And that's that expanded lexicon I'm talking about. That might be um, calling out compounds by its chemical name. It might yeah. be, you know, talking about, um, different flavor attributes that maybe don't resonate with the consumer, but is accurate to describing that product when you're looking at consistency. So working internally to um, develop your products as specifically as possible. And this isn't just related to fermentation attributes or, um, you know, the, the brand target or description. It could be the brand story as well, right? It could be more, yeah. more marketing focused. Yeah. But, you know, so what we do is we'll utilize the panel for that. So everybody on it, in theory, after trying these beers for so long and seeing these standards and these targets, really understand what this beer should be. But then the second level is, okay, we've, we understand, we've trained to these beers already, right? We've all agreed that this is what these beers are. We've set these standards. We all know how to talk about these internally. Is that the way we educate our customers? Um, and generally it's not. Um, because we're not going to get super in the weeds with these beers, but being able to digest the accuracy of descriptions that we've created and all agreed upon and, you know, oversimplify it so that when it's expressed to a, a customer, it's just using uh, vocabulary that's going to resonate with them, right? Yeah. Yeah, Nobody yeah. wants to hear about a sulfur compound, even though it might be yeah. there to style and actually affect that beer really well. Uh, you're probably not going to put that on a, on a description on a, a brand info sheet or something. So finding, you know, what are the key words here that are going to resonate with our customer? And then we can use our training, our education on these beers to, to impact our customers and, and better that experience for them. Well, and I, I think this has a nice little side effect too, because what, when you start including uh, servers and, and dishwashers and, and, uh, and prep staff to, to taste these beers and you start using terms like diacetyl or hydrogen disulfide, then um, they're gonna start learning brewer ease uh, and know that we're talking about butter and funky egg smell um, so that, um, that, that they are gonna be a little bit more savvy. They're gonna, they're gonna just kind of follow into that, that culture of education. But we all know, Eric, that, that, that people who work in this industry do go to other bars and other restaurants and other breweries and they taste other beers. Um, so by, by having that knowledge, they'll be more informed to be kind of your extended um, 
I, I call it corporate espionage. Anytime I go to a, another brewery that I don't work at, then that I and I have a different beer, I enjoy it. But I, I affectionately call it corporate espionage. But I can learn how that blonde is different from our blonde, or that your IPA is different from ours, and bring that inf information back. Um, especially if if I'm a dishwasher, bartender, busser, and I have this knowledge, then I can actually be uh, kind of an, an a continued extended advocate in that in that role as well. Totally. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I generally this is, you know, this is something I admittedly stole from somebody who probably stole it from somebody else, but it's, yeah. it's, it's resonated over the years with me to light a fire and not fill a bucket. And I think yeah. this is where the engagement comes from. Um, it's easy to create a plan or present a plan that's, these are all the things that we suggest you do for an education program. But if you're not creating excitement around that, or you're not getting buy-in, um, which is, a, again, the most difficult part with my experience, we've done a lot of a lot, a lot of internal education and training here, and we've changed it over the years. Anything from, uh, you know, one-off internal presentations of somebody speaking at a conference to uh, we had, this was pre-COVID, but we had something called bite-sized education where once a month, um, somebody would present for 20 to 30 minutes on a topic related to their job and interest, you know, all revolving around what we do as a company. Cool. Um, you know, it could be somebody that's been baking a lot of bread presenting on that, or it could yeah. be the, you know, the labs implemented a new uh, QC protocol they want to tell everybody about or, uh, but, you know, as cool as we thought it was, it was still really hard to get people to stop their daily job and, and put their work down for 30 minutes and come do this. And it seems so obvious where it's like, man, why are people not excited about this? Um, so, you know, we started incorporating a food element where we would work with a couple of local food vendors and say, come get some chicken wings or whatever while you, while you watch this, essentially bribing people to learn. But the atmosphere that that created was a lot more casual and uh, the employees tended to be a lot more receptive to it, which I think is, you know, again, something that's not often spoken about enough because there's, there's, plenty of places to find everything that's listed on here and ways to do that. But if you don't have, if you don't create the right culture for it, if you, mm -hmm. there's certain employees that are naturally going to be drawn to this stuff. Right. Um, yeah. And that's probably everybody on this call. I, know, right? I was just going to say like people that are here now. <laughs> yeah. But you know, how do we, how do we create accessibility and excitement for somebody that, um, might not genuinely be that excited about it, but once once they hear it, how do you, how do you get them into your uh, your elevator pitch, right? How do you? I think you just answered that, honestly. Um, <laughs> what, well, uh, so you just talked about, it, and like a brewery is a good example. I've I've seen breweries where the brewers, like at the end of the shift, the brewers are hanging out together having a beer, and 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 the kitchen staff they're hanging out together having a beer, and same thing in the front of the house, and. And it becomes an us versus them situation, which is not healthy for culture. And so you have to force these people to come together for a common cause. And, and I'm willing to bet you a beer that everyone on this call right now will come together for good food and good beer. Um, if not, if not everyone's interested in nerding out a beer like, like we are. And so to say, well, come on, learn about diacetyl and acetaldehyde and all these other words you can't spell, let alone pronounce. That's not a big draw, but give them food, give them beer. Um, there are other ways I've seen that, you know, gosh, they're can be effective. They can be kind of lame, um, you know, games or something like that. But, um, but beer and food, uh, prizes, Money, those are all ways I've seen uh, used with higher levels of, of effectiveness to get people where you want them. But once they're there, then, then we start kind of bonding automatically as long as we don't form our little clicks within the brewery. Uh, we need people to intermingle. Yeah, yeah, I've seen um, a lot of positive responses to, to if you have a certain subject or aspect of your product that you want to talk about and address, do it through 
a, a beverage outside of your industry or somebody else's product. Um, you know, it's one thing to say, we're going to do a training on our, our flagship IPA today, and we're going to spend half an hour talking about the brand story, what makes it special. That can seem daunting when you're working with that every day. But when you say, we're going to compare it to the most popular IPA in our region and talk about that beer and talk about what makes that beer special, relating it to the context of what you're doing, it gets people a lot more excited, I think, and it, it lends a little bit more perspective. You know, talking about um, fermentation, again, looking through food or, or bringing wine or spirits into it, um, just gives people a different lens to, to look at it. And I think everything listed on this slide, you know, are, are great, really easy, um, low hanging fruit ways of yeah. having that like types of training, but how to get people there and how to get people to retain it and care. Um, podcasts, for example, like I, th I think there's so many good resources out there, but what's the balance of something that's engaging and interesting, but also educational, right? And I think you do a good job at that. Like the, the MBAA Thank podcast you. is one of my favorite podcasts, but I can't look to do it all the time. I have to be in the right no. mindset because, <laughs> you know, if I'm not engaged in it or interested in the moment, I'm not going to retain anything. Whereas a podcast like Good Beer Matters that has a little bit more conversation to it um, is easy to, to, to pick out those, those little bits. Yeah. I, I'm, I think uh, not, not to belabor this point, but I think um, finding ways to bring people together is, is the key. Um, I think one of those ways that we haven't addressed, and it's a little bit of, uh, bigger than branches and tastings, but, um, but finding a common cause, or like I mentioned earlier, finding that purpose that everyone was driving toward. Maybe you come at it from a different point of, of view or different role, but if we're all attuned to the same purpose, um, uh, Patagonia is a company that I always kind of cite as an example of like, you know, I could, I could be making board shorts and you could be making ski jackets, but we're both in it for the same reason. Um, uh, to align people that way is great, but, but kind of getting back to your, your slide, at least, um, after you've got these people aligned and we're going in the same direction now, now it's like, okay, how can we give them the tools now that we have momentum and we're moving in a forward direction together? How do we give them the tools so that they can keep going and kind of spread that, um, ideal to our guests and to the community and, and however large or however far we want these ripples to, to flow out. Um, uh, using, like you mentioned uh, podcast. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I probably wouldn't start the good beer matters, good beer matters podcast today. If I were starting it today, cause there's so many out there that are good. Um, I think the point that I continue to do it is, is, uh, to get that story of, of why we're doing things a certain way, why, why this matters. Um, um, I did a, a podcast with, with one of your own, uh, the, the beer for boobs uh, podcast. And it was just like, we all like beer and, and we all have women in our life and we want to keep them health, healthy and safe. And, and, and so that was a story that, that hopefully brought people together uh, with, especially within the beer community, because it, it was so much more than the beer, so much more than the tap rooms. I think stuff like that is, is important to remember. Completely. Um, and there's, you know, there's um, some great conversation in the, in the chat too. And uh, what was brought up and I'll, I'll read it verbatim because I think it's pretty poignant, but you know, what do we think about user-friendly names as a way to just to attract beer drinkers that perhaps yeah. don't understand a certain style? Um, the example, you know, calling a Saison a farmhouse IPA on the basis yeah. that Saisons don't attract drinkers where IPAs do. And I think, you know, um, Marty actually has kind of the opposite of my take, but I think it's equally as valid, but borrowing acronym mentioned previously, emphasizing um, romance of the Saison style and, you know, educate without people realizing that you're educating and telling a story um, rather than uh, maybe inaccurately representing something what's what's your take on that and then i'll give you i'll give you my opinion because i think sure. it's, there's a lot of different um elements to that i i think using uh something like saison um i think that's an opportunity to educate the public not um 
I never want to dumb down the beer people. I want to bring people up to a higher level. I want things to get better. I want relationships and experiences to get better and I want education to improve. So to call um, a Saison a farmhouse, we know those are interchangeable. Um, I think that's an opportunity to uh, within the right context to explain what Saison means and the story behind that. And that's a, that, that's a great example to do that. But, um, but to, but to say uh, uh, Eric and Jer's badass baller Brown, um, that may be a name that, that doesn't you know, resonate with me um, uh, to cre create a crazy name that just makes no sense. Maybe it's like an export, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, think, I, I think there's opportunity for story, for chat, for, um, for uh, conversation. Uh, so I, 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 would, I would steer people toward using the names um, as long as they aren't confusing or ridiculous. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think we need to also understand that most people when they're deciding to purchase something or order a beer don't have the guided experience that we're talking about a lot here right yeah the only thing they know is what's written on a menu or on a yeah. beer label and a lot yeah. of that's visuals too right that's not even just the text on it it could just be the the picture one thing that drives me nuts now is um how many cool can labels are and you can't even tell what brewery brewed it or what style it is. It, it doesn't even say what kind of beer it is. <laughs> no, it's crazy. But, but um, you know, I think, you know, we saw the, the IPA craze like 10 years ago where everything was labeled IPAs and that was strictly based off of sales. But I think most importantly, it, it needs to deliver with consumer expectations. So whatever it says and whatever it's labeled, it needs to resonate with something they're already familiar with because it's the the whole argument for styles is context right is an easier way to explain something um, for a product that you probably have never tried and looking at a style you have a good idea of what that's supposed to be or most beer consumers uh, without actually trying it so you know what you're yeah. what you're picking up and buying and i think if you know what what we've seen in the last couple years is East Coast IPAs to hazy IPAs to juicy IPAs. The word juicy is, you know, the without, without stealing the phrasing, is probably the most dumbed down beer style name out there. It's very obvious what that is. You don't have to be yeah. any beer drinker. Think about any other beer style, it's whether it's Bach or Pale Ale, right? It's you have to know what that means to know what that beer is, but juicy you could just turn 21 and have a pretty good idea of what to expect from that beer. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if we have a shift towards that style of beer, continue to see that shift, right? Pastry stouts, we've kind of seen the same thing, right? Yeah. You might not know what yeah. that is. You might not know what stout is, but you know what pastries are. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, maybe I'm getting old, maybe I'm telling too many back in my day stories at this point, but, um, but you know, the whole purpose for the BJCP styles really fundamentally is to have a better form of communication. Um, and so the more that we confuse communication, uh, the harder it is. The, the more specific we can get with our communication, the better. And a good example that's not beer related is like, you know, hey, Eric, do you like blues? And you might say, well, what kind of blues? Um, well, are we talking Texas blues or Mississippi blues or Chicago blues or, or uh, West Coast surf rock blues? Or it, what is it we're talking about? But blues by itself is not a descriptive enough answer. So IPA, tell me more. Uh, East Coast IPA, okay, we're getting there. How about juicy IPA versus West Coast or brute? Or it, it's the more we can be clear in what we're trying to say, I think the better. Yeah, and, and then, you know, at, at what what point is it is it too much? Are you just throwing it on there to, to, to try to get something new out there? And, uh, you know, we had Josh comment here in the in the chat and just say, you know, are we doing due diligence by not calling out a specific style uh, to try to prompt that discovery? I think it depends. I think it depends on who you are as a brand, as a company, 
and again, it comes back to what your customers expect. You can curate the experience and the products that you want, but you have to know how to communicate that, educate your staff to communicate that yeah. and retain the quality customers that resonate with that. Um, I think there's, I think one thing that white one thing that White Labs Brewing Co hasn't done well. We've next year is our ten year anniversary, and we've done awesome at catering to the beer geek. You know, we pre COVID would have every weekend half the people in our tasting room were from out of town, and it, you know it'd be packed, and everybody was really geeky. But what if somebody just wants a good beer? Is it wrong of them to not care about it and just say, "Give me your lightest beer"? Do we need to lecture those people and say, well, we have this American light lager and it's only 4% and low carbohydrates. And it's because they use, you know, this mash schedule and this, this enzyme to, to achieve that, you know, maybe, but I also think if craft beer wants to continue to grow or probably more candidly retain the market share that it currently has, there needs to be a balance between it. And we need to understand that not everybody thinks the way we do and consumes yep. the way we do. Yep. And so a certain style might irritate us in the way it's presented, but is that allowing somebody that maybe is intimidated by some of those other styles, the ability to purchase it? Yeah, um, to your point, uh, he also put a line in there too, that the vocab in those guidelines in the BJCP and BA guidelines it's not consumer friendly. Absolutely not, because um, they're not speaking to the consumer. They're speaking to the professional. And we are the professionals. We are the guides. We are the ones who are supposed to take people on a flavor journey. We are not supposed to go out and try and create more of us. We're not supposed to go out and make people feel dumb because they don't know what we know. Our job is to, is to serve and delight. And my father's a good example. He he likes um, Coors Light. He likes Bud Light. He likes what he, he calls them sissy beers. He likes the, mm -hmm. the lighter, uh, the lower SRM, the better. And, and so my job was not to say, dad, you big you know, dummy. No, my, my job was to say, what is it you like? Great. I know exactly what you're going to like. Try this, try that. So now he doesn't know that he likes Kolsch or a blonde or a cream ale or a lager, he just knows that um, I'm gonna get him something that he likes and not give him something he doesn't like. That's really, really our job, I yeah. think. Yeah, I've, you know, I'm sure a lot, again, a lot of people on this call um, resonate with it that, you know, if they're at a table, it's not uncommon for some, somebody around you, if it's friends or family, what should I order, uh -huh. right? It's like, you know, I, I can help you with that. But to me, the experience or the way things are, aren't presented is not accessible enough to where you're overwhelmed or maybe beer is not accessible enough or I'm not accessible enough to where you feel intimidated to, to order something, right? And so that's where I think those, you know, different ways of describing styles or you know, whether we keep accurate to the style and use use tasting notes and different copy on, on menus or labels as a way of explaining that again, or imagery, right? If you have a can and it's got a lot of a, a bouquet of tropical fruit on it, mm -hmm. you've prob you're, you're communicating without actually um, writing it on there. So I think it's a great conversation on, you know, looking at education through, uh, the way people learn and everybody learns differently yeah. and when you're setting up staff education it kind of comes back to the front of house versus back of house because that in, innately is going to have a different style of learning based off of the way they're viewing those products yeah. and then you have to look at everybody's individual learning styles within that mm -hmm. so if you're creating an education program keep that in mind look at engagement and inspiration and offering different types of learning, like not just, you know, having Zoom calls where you lecture everybody on, on a product, but maybe something's hands-on, maybe it's malt steeping, you know, maybe it's um, not just tasting beer. 
Um, I listened to uh, another good podcast, uh, Beer with Nat. Um, yesterday, she was interviewing uh, Kara Simpson from Aroxa uh, Technologies, or, you know, the flavor standards. And the comment that they made is, especially for all of us in this call, it's like you have these flavor standards. You have the stuff that you need to know so that you can guide. But, but more importantly, to this education standpoint, to people who are not at a higher level, you still have to uh, understand what this is, but you have to relate it to something that you know and something that matters to you. And um, a good example, I think, um, for anyone who lives in Southern California right now has ever been to Disneyland, uh, this, this might connect pretty hard, but um, whenever I smell musty in a beer or even in a wine, um, that is an aroma and a flavor that, that should make you cringe, but I love it. Do you know why? Because that takes me to the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disneyland. And, and just having that, that water and that wood indoors just creates this musty smell. And every time I get musty in my beer, I'm a 10 year old kid going on that ride again. And, and so having that ability to relate it to something that, you know, um, you know, the butyric acid, if you have, uh, people who are not parents, they're not going to get baby diaper or baby vomit out of that. So we have to relate it to something that, that makes sense to them. And I think that's the, um, one of the ways you're talking about, that's the way that's going to kind of clinch that thing, whether they're visual people or experiential kinesthetic people, or, uh, more just like, uh, um, uh, what's the term, more engineering minded people where it's just, I just show me the facts. I think there's a way to connect it to something that, you know, well said. So, you know, kind of wrapping everything up, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to add them to the chat or Q and a, we've got a couple more minutes, but, um, just realizing that learning never ends, uh, you know, anytime you get new staff and you can't just put them through onboarding and expect them to retain everything present that information um, through different mediums consistently. Mm -hmm. Again, consistency shows importance. And I think people really understand that doing something once they're going to think it's, you know, either this is fun and just something that gets me out of work for a little bit, or it probably doesn't matter that much. But if you keep presenting the same information through different mediums, through different formats, um, the importance of it will resonate a little bit better and create a culture around it, education, right? Um, again, light a, light a fire, not fill a bucket. Um, it's a lot easier to, to inspire people to find those answers themselves. Um, otherwise, it takes a lot of time and a lot of de dedication when you're not training for specific job functions, right? The ROI is also not quite as tangible. Um, how, do you, how do you validate and measure taking a staff of 15 people for a half an hour, which is seven and a half labor hours, right? To do a training, what is everybody gaining from that? Um, yeah. Is it culture building? Or are you actually trying to, to teach your staff something that you can measure against? And then, you know, kind of in the same vein, but, you know, fo focus less on certificates and more on the act of learning. Uh, we've done a lot of um, certified beer server training here. We've got a eight week or eight hours worth of content that we split up over four weeks. And we do it in both of our locations about once a year. And it's a lot of tasting and all that. And we say, you know, the company will, if you attend this uh, to the best of your ability and we have, you know, little fun homework assignments and quizzes and stuff, and you complete this internal course, the company will, you know, pay for your certified beer server exam. What I've seen is, there's a lot of people that take the course, not a lot of people that actually take the exam. Um, so, you know, it goes to show like, what's, what's the purpose of this? And it's been great. You know, we've had a lot of people engaged in different beer styles. Oh, that yeast strain, these yeast strains are used for this beer style. I had no idea that this is why it influenced that. Right. Yeah. But you know, the results for different employees and different people are going to be uh, what drives them is different. And so it's good to acknowledge that so that you have a better idea of what the desired outcome is before you implement it, you know, eight hours of training. Because again, it might not seem like that much, but when you get a room of 10 people that do eight, eight hours of training, that's 80 labor hours. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot of cost. That's a lot of cost. Yeah, for sure. And, and to your point, it's like, if you want everyone to have that nice little certificate, great. If you want everyone to be able to talk the talk, that's kind of a parallel but different conversation. So, 
Cool. Yeah. And uh, Chris asked, in terms of training for certifications, would you do that off the clock or on the clock, especially when it isn't required? So that is a great question. And um, I would say 95% of the trainings that we've done um, are um, on the clock trainings. But uh, for something like that, that is, uh, especially something where tasting is heavily involved, it would be on the clock for positions that we did require it or highly encouraged, encouraged it. So, so public facing positions or, or brewing positions or off the clock, but you know, free of charge and you get this, this great educational experience and get to taste all these great beers for something like admin staff, right? That, that maybe would benefit from it, but um, isn't required. But if it's a general lunch and learn, specific tastings, um, sensory panel, that's that's all been on the clock. And I think that also shows the same as consistency, uh, paying employees for it shows the seriousness and lends a little bit of weight to it. While the company really wants you to do this and really cares for you to do this because we're willing to pay you to do it. Yeah. Whereas we occasionally will do, you know, wine, wine classes that, um, you know, it might be off the clock at, you know, four yeah. or five well, o'clock on a Thursday or whatever. And, and I'll bet you most people on this call had the drive to go out and get it and go out and, you know, uh, put the burden on themselves to go do this. But um, I worked for a brewery that uh, I wanted to bartend. And if I, if I wanted to bartend, then I had to get my certified beer server. I had no idea what Cicerone was, but they were going to pay for it and they required it. So it's like, sure, let's go do that. Um, and so they value that, but you know, they, they could have incentivized as a sales rep, maybe if you do have this training, you get bonused or incentivized or something. And if you don't, that's okay, but we're not gonna give you that incentive. Um, I think there's different ways to approach that, but. Totally. Cool. So I wanna thank you again for uh, joining today. Where can everybody uh, find you, uh, Good Beer Matters? We didn't even ask, you know, tell the audience where you're located. No, that's okay. Um, so you guys can reach out to me on, uh, I spend all my social media time is on Instagram. So I'm at good beer matters. Um, you can find me on the, on goodbeermatters.net. Um, if you want to send me an email, I'm Jeremy at goodbeermatters.net. Um, but otherwise that's, that's, I spend a lot of my time there. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining and uh, thank you everybody who took time out of your Wednesday to, to hang out with us. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. It was thank a good, great conversation and um, I know there's some comments on you know looking for um, specific tools of of training and engagement if anybody has any additional questions they can uh, either email Jeremy and or myself yeah, totally. um, we'd be happy to to outline a little bit what that looks like but I think um, just getting everybody in the right mindset of why education is important um, is is really important and often overlooked because you know just telling somebody how to do something as opposed to why they're doing it isn't nearly as impactful so thanks again i hope hope you have a, a good afternoon everybody else on the call as well yeah thank you everyone cheers thanks.